So there we are. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here to, to give this keynote. So I'm really happy to be able to present to you. And second, I would like to say that, of course, the usual disclaimer applies. So these are my personal views, and they are not the views of the ECB or the Euro system. So I was asked to talk about how the ECB controls the current monetary system. So I structured my talk along these lines. And I would like to first talk a little bit about the ECB's mandate and strategy, then about monetary policy impl uh, implementation, then about how we think about the transmission of monetary policy. And finally, as I was also asked to say something on QE, I would like to briefly explain some of the effects of unconventional policies. So starting with the ECB's mandate and strategy, this is laid down in Article 127 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And it's clearly spelled out that the primary object objective of the Euro system shall be to maintain price stability. And then there is a second part of this uh, article saying, without prejudice to the object of price stability, the ECB shall support the general economic policies in the Union. And these general economic policies are laid down in an article in the Treaty on European Union, and they give sort of a framework of in which environment monetary policy is supposed to operate. So they are very general, stating that there should be a free and common market, that there should be free competition, a balanced growth, and uh, objectives like that. So without a direct bearing on uh, the monetary policy strategy. So the ECB concretized these uh, price stability objective by a quantitative definition, and the governing council uh, stated that it aims to maintain inflation rate at levels below but close to 2% over the medium term. Why below but close to 2%? Well, below because high inflation is not a good thing because um, money loses its value and typically uh, inflation volatility also increases with the rate of inflation. But close to 2% is to avoid deflation and to also have a little bit of leeway for monetary policy in adjusting interest rates in response to economic contractions. The ECB also set out that it wants to um, pursue its strategy based on two pillars. And the two pillars are on the one hand the economic analysis, on the other hand the monetary analysis. And economic analysis is more geared towards the short, short term so it's an analysis of the economic dynamics and economic shocks, whereas monetary analysis is more looking at the medium to long-term trends in monetary developments to get information about long-term trends in the price level. So overall, these two sets of information are put together to achieve a full picture of economic developments, and this is what's meant by this famous cross-checking. So when we look at the economic analysis and get a statement on the um, uh, state of the economy, then we also look at monetary analysis to corroborate whether the long-term uh, developments are in line with what follows from the um, economic analysis. So what you see here are two lines that show long-term developments in inflation and in money growth. So the blue line is smooth M3 growth, whereas the yellow line is smooth uh, HICP inflation. And you can see that there is a long-run relationship between these two lines. So when money growth and free growth is high, inflation tends to be high as well, whereas when money growth declines, inflation declines. But what you can also see is that there is not a one-to-one -one relationship. So, for example, there are swings in money growth which are not mirrored by inflation. So there is a relationship, but this relationship is not simple and is not one-to-one. -one. So coming from the strategy, I now would like to talk about monetary policy implementation. So I had laid out, first, there is the primary objective, which is price stability, and this comes from the law. Then there is the monetary policy strategy, which states how this uh, primary objective is to be fulfilled, which is um, set by the ECB and rests on this quantitative definition of price stability as well as the two pillars. And then it's implemented by steering short-term interest rates on the interbank market. So the implementation of monetary policy involves the choice of an operational target, typically an interest rate, 
and then the instruments that are used to achieve this interest rate, to keep this interest rate on the target level. And these are the standard conventional and in more recent times also the unconventional tools. So how is uh, liquidity steered in an interest rate corridor? So what you can see on this chart is first the uh, upper and the lower bound of the corridor. So the upper bound is given by the marginal lending rate and the lower uh, bound is given by the uh, rate on the deposit facility. And in between there is the rate on the main refinancing operations, which is typically the rate where interbank market rates should fluctuate uh, around. We have the demand for reserves. This is the blue solid line. And the demand for reserves is downward sloping. This is because a certain uh, amount of reserves is needed by the banks to fulfill minimum reserve requirements. Then we have um, excess reserves. So banks may choose to hold more than the minimum reserve requirements for, effect, for effecting payments among them. And finally, there is what we call the autonomous factors, which is government deposits and also um, as a government deposits with the central bank and uh, bank notes in circulation. To achieve these minimum, this target rate, uh, the target supply of reserves has to be steered in a way that the interbank market clears at exactly this rate. And this is done by doing um, forecasts of the uh, needed demand for reserves and to achieve this uh, point on the downward sloping reserve uh, curve where the target supply exactly implements this uh, main refinancing operations rate or the, the money market rate that is desired. And this is done through different types of operations. The most important ones are, before the crisis, have been the minor, main refinancing operations, which are conducted weekly with a one-week maturity. Then there are longer term operations which uh, have a maturity of three months and are conducted once a month. And finally, there is the opportunity to also do fine tuning operations uh, when there is evidence that um, money markets might um, yeah, experience some strains and uh, interest rates are too volatile. They will never go above the marginal lending facility rate because there there is an elastic supply of reserves at this rate and they will also not fall below the deposit facility rate because banks can always store their excess liquidity on the deposit facility and obtain the deposit facility rate. So, and this is how um, interest rates did evolve over time. So you see the corridor, the red and the blue lines, and you see the policy rate, the minor financing operations rate in the middle. And you can see that the Ionia, uh, the overnight market uh, interbank uh, rate, fluctuates around the main refinancing operations rate. There is some volatility because these operations are done only once a week, so banks have to plan and they may be wrong, so there might be end of quarter effects, end of month effects, but overall, up to the financial crisis, they fluctuated with some volatility around the policy rate. Now, more recently, you can see that these rates have declined and they are now close to the bottom of the corridor, so not, no longer around the main refinancing operations rate, but in effect at the bottom of the corridor. And this is the case because this corridor system in the end has evolved to a de facto floor system on account of the um, asset purchases that have been conducted since 2014. So we are now not in a target supply that cuts the demand for reserves at the target interest rate, but we have now a target supply that's far beyond uh, the um, downward sloping part of the curve and implements in effect a, a floor system. So the policy rate is at the lower bound of the corridor. This can also be seen in the evolution of the ECB's balance sheet. So you see here the different operations in the balance sheet. So first, at the beginning of the uh, sample before the crisis, there was a almost two-thirds of long-term refinancing operation, one-third of the main refinancing operation, and then with the on onset of the crisis, the long-term refinancing operations, the yellow uh, part of the chart, became much more prominent. Until then, in 2011, there were the first asset purchases, which is the blue part of the chart, and in 2014, we have a big amount of asset purchases, so the blue part increases quite heavily, and we also have the um, 
green one and the red one. The red one is uh, private sector security purchases, and the green one are the targeted long-term refinancing operations. So the, uh, the balance sheet of the ECB has expanded quite a bit, and this has led to a, excess, a, a supply of excess reserves that had kept uh, interest rates at the bottom of the corridor. So I'm coming to the transmission of monetary policy. What I have been talking about now is the supply of the monetary base. And the central bank is the monopoly supplier of the monetary base, which consists of currencies and reserves and uh, the recourse of credit institution to the deposit facility. So these are different accounts, so that's why both of them are listed. So these items are liability of the central bank and they are on the ECB's balance sheet. This is not the same as the monetary aggregates. So the monetary aggregates, the M3, which I showed you before, is not a liability of the central bank, but a liability of a uh, commercial bank, so of the banking system. And they are um, defined as the sum of currency in circulation, like M0, almost, so M0 is banknotes, this is currency, and uh, deposits of different maturities, so either only overnight or um, two-year deposits uh, or even M3, which is relatively broad, also increases, uh, includes um, repurchase ag agreements, money market funds, debt securities, and with a maturity of up to two years. But this is a quite different thing than the monetary base, which can be exclusively controlled by the central bank, whereas this is endogenous and evolves from an interplay of um, deposit decisions, credit uh, creation, and is in the, yeah, is determined by, either, by interest rates on the one hand and credit demand and deposit demand on the other hand. So when we think of monetary transmission, in the classical pre-crisis world, monetary policy was affected by changes in interest rates and these changes in official interest rates affected money market rates. So I showed you the first chart where the money market rate fluctuates around the rate of uh, the main refinancing operations. And these money market interest rates uh, influence expectations and via expectations and interest rates, asset prices react, um, the exchange rate reacts, we have reactions in money and credit, and money and credit in the end are determined by decisions in the banking sector, which is this quadrant over there, where um, the monetary policy affects things like capital of banks, the funding costs of banks, credit standards, and uh, bank deposit and lending rates. This together impacts on the demand for goods and services and their prices, so that's where in the end the inflation rate is um, affected. When having unconventional instruments, the transmission mechanism doesn't change that much. The point is that the instruments impact on different parts of the transmission mechanism. So we have on the one hand a direct impact on market rates, we have also a signaling impact on expectations, but we have on the other hand direct impacts on the banking sector, for example by the targeted long-term refinancing operations, and we can also have direct impacts on money and credit aggregates, for example if a euro area resident sells um, their security and if the securities are then, so the proceeds from the sale is then kept on a deposit account of a commercial bank. So there are a number of additional transmission channels which helped to um, revive the economy in a situation where interest rates were constrained by a lower bound. Overall, if the central bank would be able to control money aggregates completely, there are still enough parts in the transmission process where the link to inflation can be variable. For example, money and output doesn't need to be uh, related one to one. And we can also see with changes in the structure of the economy, for example, digitalization, globalization, there doesn't need to be a uh, one to one impact from um, capacity constraints in the economy to price changes. So overall, there are various parts in the transmission that can um, that are variable and uh, that don't allow for a one-to-one -one link between money growth and uh, inflation. So finally, I would like to say some words on unconventional policies. So unconventional policies took a lot of forms. So 
from the key interest rates, we went into negative territory, what can also be seen as unconventional. We have changes in the operational framework. Just to mention a few, the collateral framework has been relaxed. There have been longer term operations, so beyond the usual three months, up to three years. Then there have been targeted longer term uh, lending operations, which uh, give a preferential interest rate to banks who extend credit to the real economy. We have fixed rate full allotment to give banks the certainty that they can obtain funds at a specific interest rate and that they will not be bid out of the market or out of the tender. Then there has been forward guidance as well on rates as on the unconventional measures. So until recently, the communication was that um, asset purchases will be pursued as long as necessary and in any event until the end of September 2018. And now it's, uh, the communication is that they will be uh, expected to um, be phased out at the end of the year. So this also um, was a measure to affect um, expectations of market participants. And finally, there are the purchase programs. So private sector purchase program, uh, corporate bond purchase program, uh, public sector purchase program, and in the early stages of the crisis, um, purchase program that were uh, intended to relieve market stress. So overall, these um, uh, measures were intended to provide a three-pronged approach to monetary policy easing. We have credit easing on the one hand through the uh, credit measures, namely the targeted long-term refinancing operations, which are meant to ensure an effective pass-through of um, interest rates to bank lending rates, that is to households and to firms. Second, we have the forward guidance, which signals the future monetary policy stance um, to uh, influence longer-term uh, decisions of market participants. And finally, we have the asset purchase programs, which serve to compress longer-term term premium in a situation where the short-term money market rates are already very low and uh, are not, yeah, it's not all possible to, to bring them even lower. So, of course, we have investigated what the effect, the macroeconomic effect of these um, measures was and is. And to assess the macroeconomic effect, of course, you have to need model, uh, to use models. And um, there are many different models around, and uh, they, of course, give different results. So what we have done is uh, to run counterfactuals with uh, projections without policy measures and compare them with projections with policy measures or the actual outcomes. And these projections without policy measures are done on the one hand using the ECB's main forecasting model, but on the other hand also relying on working groups where uh, participants from the national central banks use their model and therefore there is a range of outcomes which is indicated by these uh, error bars. So there are different models giving different results and the median of the models are the little diamonds. And if you look at the outcomes, um, then we see that there is accumulated effects of the policy measures of around two percentage points from uh, 2016 going out to 2019. So we see a tangible effect on inflation and on output growth from these policy measures. And when assessing these policy measures, you also have to keep in mind that these models, of course, assume that there is a stable development. So they assume that there is not sort of deflationary spiral or other things which are outside of these model horizons, but um, they assume that eventually this will converge back to with equilibrium steady state. So overall, we can see that there is a tangible effect of these policy measures, of the unconventional policy measures, and uh, that they help to bring output and inflation towards the um, so inflation towards the medium-term objective of the ECB. So I think I stop here, and I would like to thank you for the attention. My name is Josef Huber. Uh, on your explanation of the transmission mechanism, I mean, uh, uh, no doubt that uh, the central bank can strongly influence interest rates at the, the, the money market, at the interbank reserves money market, but uh, excess reserves of the bank just represent a very tiny fraction of the entire stock of bank deposit money. 
And how do you imagine that a central bank interest rate on a tiny fraction of the, of the stock of bank money can really influence banks' credit extension? Well, you can see that interbank rates always have been very close to the main refinancing operation rate. And in the end, it's the marginal, the marginal quantity of reserves that determines the pricing of the reserve stock. And if you think that it's a problem when this marginal quantity is very small, I wouldn't agree, because in the end, this pricing applies to all trades that would be done at this, uh, at this rate. So currently, it's not the case. So currently, the excess reserves are huge. Um, in some countries, they are about 80% of the money stock. And um, in the end, it's not relevant on which amount of excess reserves the price is done, because it will transmit via arbitrage um, relations throughout the economy, and that's what we are, we are seeing. And, yeah, so we can see a close link between uh, the policy rate, interbank rates, it's going through to lending rates and then uh, on, on long-term rates. So this interest rate transmission in general works relatively well and uh, the whole spectrum of market rate adjusts to policy rate changes in, in a relatively brief time. My name is Christoph Pluger. I would like to know whether you agree that asset prices should be included in the inflation um, calculation uh, in order to make sure that ECB policies are really up to the reality because the asset prices have gone up tremendously since uh, the start of the financial crisis. Well, there's a long discussion on this question and um, most central banks agree on targeting a measure of uh, consumer price inflation. So the idea is that you, in this consumer price inflation measure you have things that the private sector consumes so where the private sector is the end user of this um, good. And there is, rents are in because you consume housing services and you pay the rent. But if you think of buying a house, then um, you have a part of it is housing services, but part of it is an asset. And if you sell it to somebody else, then of course this buyer has to pay a higher price and experiences inflation, but you as the seller, you get a higher return and you experience um, asset price gains or valuation gain. So therefore, conceptually, asset prices don't fit into a measure of consumer price inflation. You would probably include new housing, but the stock of new housing, so what's built, so the cost of creating houses, the stock of new housing is tiny compared to what is exchanged among the private sector. And when you have the sectoral perspective, then you would have the consumer sector versus the producer sector. And it's only the part that's exchanged from the producer sector to the consumer sector which enters these measures of inflation. So, Emma Dornay, um, does, um, do the ECB models include the model that uh, Michael Kumhoff was just explaining to us? So I must admit that I don't have a full overview of what is done in the models. So um, the main model probably doesn't have this mechanism that you were referring to, but uh, in structure, of course, we are very interested in looking at uh, what happens in the banking sector. And um, we, we are, there is a whole division <laughs> called monetary analysis, which looks at monetary transmission through the banking sector and also does a lot of empirical analysis based on bank data. So nowadays we have great data, what's really happening in banks, how the balance sheet evolves. And of course, this gives insight on the policy measures and uh, what effects are coming through the banking sector and uh, how they react to, to interest rate changes and to other measures. So on top, uh, at the base, Yeah, my name is Axel Wiand. Uh, let me just put uh, a question to both of you, uh, Michael Komov and yourself. Uh, if I take the insights from the model, it's pretty clear that what is missing after the crisis is equity. Do you think we would have had a different policy response, a different macroeconomic development if we had recapitalized our banks in Europe more forcefully, more decisively? 
Well, I can only say that uh, the euro area took uh, measures. So the single supervisory mechanism has been established in response to the crisis, which allows for uh, supervision of the major banks in the euro area to ensure common standards. So the problem of weak banks is well recognized, but this is not something that's particular. This is a task for supervision. This is not something monetary policy with interest rate decisions can uh, yeah, change. Okay, now it's, uh, I have to put a, uh, <laughs> ask a question. Um, ECB is an independent agency, independent from politics, and has a concrete mandate. And do you think um, unconventional polit policies, you, um, you really involve, uh, you, you get into politics, you, you buy um, IOUs from, from states and private IOUs, And do you think uh, this is covered by your man mandate? Could you still an uh, independent agency, or should there then more be more control, democratic control, or change of your mandate? Well, open market operations have always been tools for no, central case. banks. So modern central banks have always been able to buy um, open yeah, securities on the open market. Scale. The ECB has limits. Some of them are in, in the statute, for example, that you cannot buy public sector securities on private markets, uh, on primary markets. Some of them are self-imposed, for example, that we don't want to buy um, public sector securities in excess of uh, one third of the, the issuance or from a single issuer. So therefore, there are a number of limits and um, the monetary policy of the ECB is well within what is allowed for the ECB in the statute and in the treaties. So there's no problem in your... No. The <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, there was, uh, I saw one, one last question. Ah, uh, here, yes, please. Um, what about helicopter money? Uh, represent <laughs> Okay, my name is Thomas Ostheim. I'm asking you, um, what are you thinking about giving money directly to the citizens to guarantee the inflation? Yeah, just to make sure, these are my very personal opinions, so no official statements. So first, when you look at the treaties of central banks, they generally are not allowed to give money away in a sense. So all what we are doing is credit operations. So money is given out to the banks and we get securities and after a certain term this uh, operations is exchanged back. So the main operations are all repurchase operations. Mm -hmm. So in the end the central bank always obtains the value for the currency or liquidity it's issuing to the banking sector. And I think it's very important because as I showed that uh, inflation is not always moving one to one with money not with broad money and not with the monetary base. So it's important that you are able to withdraw monetary base from circulation in the event people don't use cash anymore or there is less liquidity demand or whatever. So you need to have something on your balance sheet which you can sell against money that's out because otherwise this money that's out there would be either devalued by inflation or you would have to tax it or somehow remove, confiscate it and so therefore The, the assets on the central bank balance sheet give the flexibility to adjust the money supply. So I think we, we stop the end of the next, uh, the next part. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. And